All right, it's seven o'clock. Let's call the meeting to order. Please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Mary and Council, I have a couple of uh, ads to the agenda after we hear the presentation from Sheriff Camerud uh, of items for new business. Um, if we can move the existing items down and add, uh, make 9.1 River Bluff, it's uh, River Bluff Villas or Estates Infrastructure, 9.2, uh, the 2019 Improvement Project, and then we'll go on from there into the organization resolution and the strategic plan update. So if I could get a motion and a second and an approval from the council to amend the agenda as stated. I'll make a motion to approve the agenda as stated from Brent. Motion by council member Henry. I'll second. Second by council member Mock. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <coughs> motion passes. All right, um, resident comments and questions. Anybody, anybody? All right. Um, no presentations and reports, or I'm sorry, we do have a presentation. We have uh, Carver County's new sheriff, Jason Cameron. Come on up. Well, thank you. Uh, Madam Mayor, members of the council, I appreciate you having me here tonight. Um, I, I am uh, Jason Cameron, I'm your new sheriff, uh, but I'm not new to the sheriff's office. I have been with the office for 28 years. Uh, started with uh, in Carver County when I was, uh, you know, 19 years old, turning 20. The sheriff gave me an initial issue of uniforms and, uh, you know, some a bottle of Clearasil and sent me to work. <laughs> and so I, I've been there ever since. And, and uh, when uh, when Sheriff Jim Olson uh, announced his retirement, I decided that I was going to run for for the office and and ultimately won in November. And I'm just I'm I'm happy to be here. Uh, I wanted to talk just a little bit um, about uh, some of the things that I think if I were on the city council, I might question if we had a new sheriff, uh, particularly if we're involved in contract policing, <laughs> which is which the city of Carver does. Um, I, I don't have any plans to make any substantive changes to the contract policing model or to the methodology that we use for calculating contract costs. So I think as you go into uh, 2019 and you begin your uh, budget planning and, and some of those long-term strategies, uh, just know that our methodology is gonna be pretty consistent. And so it, you know, the numbers change, of course, but the, the method of how we got there is pretty consistent. And I know your city administrator is pretty dialed in on, on how all that stuff works. And, and so that should make things a little bit easier for you. Uh, organizationally in the sheriff's office, of course, when, when Jim retired and, and uh, I was elected, that created a vacancy at the uh, chief deputy's position, the position I held before, and, and uh, Pat Barry has accepted that uh, position. Pat comes to us, he's been with us for about 15 years. Uh, he had five years of uh, municipal police, policing before that, so 20 years total service. Uh, he was formerly the lieutenant of our investigative services and uh, professional responsibilities. And, uh, and then he had been a patrol lieutenant uh, as well. And so he's really squared away operationally. Guy is wicked smart. And uh, so I, I'm looking forward to having him uh, involved in helping us navigate some of the operational issues that, that I'm sure we're to uh, encounter. Um, that then, of course, creates some additional opportunities. Uh, that being we had a commander who retired and then Pat vacated a lieutenant's position. And so we're gonna stay internally. You'll, so we'll see some movement in there. I think it's, we have the talent internally and I just think it's important to uh, have that, um, create the, those uh, career paths for, for our employees. Um, the, for the city of Carver, that will be uh, pretty seamless, or it ought to feel pretty seamless, but uh, for your city administrator and your staff, there's gonna be different names in terms of who's running the operations in, in patrol services and uh, in investigations. And then as your contract liaison, uh, the commander will be new. Paul Cheetah retired 
Um, but nevertheless, you rest assured, we will make sure that whoever is in there is, is qualified. Um, you know, Paul's got <laughs> pretty tough shoes to fill, though, uh, but I'm, I think we'll be okay. Uh, lastly, I just want to talk um, briefly about, uh, you know, things that we want to do going forward. I, I could tell in my months uh, of conversations with uh, various city councils, city council candidates, that uh, we have been a little short on our explanation of uh, contracting, the model, the methodology that we use for getting at costs, how we arrive at, what our recommendations are. And so in March, maybe, maybe in April, we'll see what it looks like, definitely before summer, because I know people's calendars fills up. I'd like to uh, book a meeting with the uh, city administrator and the mayor, and probably at least one council member, if if uh, he or she chooses to, to attend from all of the cities, but to, to kind of go back and, and walk through some of the historical stuff uh, on how we got there. I think that's those are, things are pretty important to understand when you're making decisions about uh, you know, public safety issues um, and, and uh, you know, contracting and, and why we recommend what we recommend and, and what there's a, um, it's easy to get the contract and the numbers in front of you and those are port important things. But I think the context and how we got there is really helpful when it comes time to A, make a decision, but also uh, B, inform your constituents of, of how and why you're, you're doing it uh, the way you are. And then lastly, I have to do a shameless plug for the, uh, the Citizens Academy. We're, we're recruiting for our Citizens Academy and if you haven't done it, I encourage you to, uh, to enroll. Um, it, it has been tremendously successful. I think everybody who's been there has had a lot of fun and learned a lot about it. So it's 11 weeks one night a week, three hours, um, and you'll spend some time in patrol, you'd spend some time in dispatch, you'll send, spend some time processing a mock crime scene, uh, you'll have an opportunity to uh, uh, witness and participate in field coordination exercises and, and all of those things that we do. And I, I think it, it really helps, particularly for elected officials like yourself, to get an understanding of how and why law enforcement does some of the things that we do. And it will help you field questions, it will help you as you're uh, reading reports uh, to get an understanding of what the rationale was for some of those things. And I'm talking reports like newspaper articles, but also if you have access to uh, um, police reports and so and such, I, I think there's some benefit to it. And it's fun. You know, you'll, you'll probably laugh and giggle all the way through it, and so it's time well spent, I promise. Um, and then the very last thing I have is, is uh, just my, my usual, um, I will share my information, my, all my contact information with Brent, and then he can distribute it to you guys, so you'll have direct dial and my cell phone, um, and I would, I'm available 24-7, 365 uh, for whatever needs you have. And then uh, obviously the sheriff's office is also open 24-7, 365. And so when your citizens ask about, hey, I saw thus and such, what should I do? Uh, if it's a police matter, have, have them call us. Uh, our, our number is, it's 911. You're not, you, you know, back in the day, uh, you only called 911 for emergencies. And, and uh, while that still might technically be the preferred thing, we, uh, the, our phone capacity is such that we can handle that and that's just our number. So um, have them call. We're, we're staffed 24-7, 365 and available to respond to your calls. So, any questions or comments or concerns, I, things I need to know about? Is there a non-emergency number that we can use too? There is. The non-emergency number is 952-361-1231. Uh, and a uh, little bit more challenging to remember, but but nevertheless, that phone gets answered 24-7, too. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say, and I've shared with you, I participated in the Citizens Academy two years ago, right after I had been elected to council, and it is so insightful. Um, it's really hands-on. It's Thursday nights again, right? Uh, I don't know which night they scheduled okay. it for this go-around, but it you was, can find it on our website. Okay, it was, it was Thursday nights, and I remember thinking going into it, oh, I'm normally dragging by Thursday nights, <laughs> three hours. <laughs> 
like you're up, you're down, you're moving. There's a you know a, a fighting action part of it. There's such thing as beer goggles. Who knew? Um, <laughs> you know, it's it was really really insightful, and I was really impressed with the sheriff's department on how open and transparent and how um, reactive and responsive you were to everyone's questions and it's just a really transparent, insightful process. So if you guys can spare the time, I highly suggest you participate. Did you put the cuffs on anybody? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no. So. All right, any other questions? Jason, we're yeah. looking forward to working with you. The sheriff has always been good to Carver and um, if there's any questions you have for us or the city, just contact Brent or any one of us and um, we'll be more than happy to accommodate. Thank you, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for singing by. Thanks. All right. Um, <laughs> no public hearings. Up next is the consent agenda. I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda. We have a motion from Council Member Henry. I'll make a second. We have a second from Council Member Sayer. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. All right, unfinished business, the organizational resolution. City manager. I believe that we wanted to move up. Yep, so we'll skip oh, that. New business. I'm sorry. I thought you said oh. 9.1 and 9.2. Yeah, I thought you said 9.1. But it's going to 8? Correct. Okay, Okay. That's so then, understand. sorry about that. We need to get the city attorney on his way. Okay. We always want to keep. Double stack of meetings. We always want to keep the city attorney happy. Okay. Well, kind of. In order to keep the city attorney happy, <laughs> let's discuss 9.1. I think you said that that was River Bluff Estates. Okay. Sorry. <coughs> we have any? Are you have the memo up? It's just are they looking at the memo? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, well, uh, I'm not talking off anything off the screen, so it's just going to be uh, the memo we put together in your packet. So uh, we're looking at the River, River Bluffs uh, explanation here that you've probably uh, digested. If, uh, if you haven't here, I'll explain it to you tonight. But ultimately, it's a, a HOA, Homeowners Association, that is looking for some advice on uh, you know, what, uh, what, what they should do about uh, developers' request to put wear and course pavement down on their streets. This, this goes back a while. It's kind of an unusual circumstance in which, uh, you know, I think it's over 10 years ago, the original development started. Uh, some pavement went down. A base course uh, lift of pavement went down. Uh, you know, through all the, the, the issues that, that occurred, you know, some 10 years ago, the uh, developer did not finish. Um, however, however that occurred, they, they didn't finish the development, so it sat there for a long period of time, undeveloped, no homes. Um, and then uh, the base course was there. And then more recently, uh, there was a new, new developer's agreement that uh, you know, Larry, Larry was a, a part of for a new develop, uh, development what changed the housing styles, but effectively it's the same footprint. It went right on top of the, uh, the uh, original plat. And so then they started building up these, these homes and they were doing that on top of a base course that had been there for quite some time. And what has occurred is the pavement was, you know, reasonably damaged. I mean, from uh, as I would, as I would speculate, it was damaged from the construction equipment on this this base course that had been in place for a long time. The HOA had had some concerns that okay, if they put the wear course down, are they fulfilling their agreement uh, to to give us a good good street section with uh, good pavement? And you know that that is ultimately what I was reviewing. Is as taking a look at is is this the right thing to do? So all all circumstances aside, I'm just going to talk purely about the what the findings. Uh, what what we did look at is the pavement and the trails and the side and the and the curb and say what what's what's typical. What would we do? This is a private street, and it's an HOA and a developer. But I'm just going to look at this purely from the perspective of uh, if, if any type of a public street, uh, you know, were, were reviewed like this, what would we do? And uh, the finding would be we would not put the wear course on it. There's there's far too much cracking and, and damage uh, that 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 we've we've seen, in which if you did put that wear course lift on, we'd likely expect that to crack right through, and it's it's going to have a premature uh, failure more maintenance in the future than you typically need <coughs> on, a, on a new roadway. Uh, and we'd, we'd expect some, some uh, pavement failures uh, in the near future. So 
the the finding on on our part was if we were to to go ahead and look at this circumstance with the pavement as it is today we would probably go back and recommend it be reclaimed which <laughs> means effectively you take take that base core pavement out uh grind it up you put the base base course of uh of rock back down and then you put two new lifts of pavement uh on top of that you, you'd effectively rebuild it is is uh, you know how i'd put it so if we were to say uh, to the homeowner association, what uh, would we do? That is it. And uh, the thing is, is what's unique about this is that goes to the HOA, and then they're they're faced with, uh, well, okay, now what do what do we as a HOA do? And there is a letter of credit that was that Larry uh, secured uh, that is outstanding here with $166,000 left in it. The original letter of credit from their first development expired, so it's, it's great that a new one was put in place with, uh, with the new develop, development. And so there is money set aside, and that, that's intended to a secure placement of the wearing course pavement. And so that the agreement's pretty specific that uh, the wearing course has to be accepted. So this gets into be a little bit of a, uh, I guess, a complicating scenario in which we don't necessarily have a position to mandate anything as far as how they might go about taking care of these repairs prior to putting the wear course down. But we, we do have an agreement that's pretty explicit that says we have to accept the end result. And it would be my opinion that we would not accept the end result if that wearing course was put on that base course because we know it's going to crack up, crack up and fail prematurely in, in any normal set of circumstances. So um, I could probably go on about this a fair amount, but it, this really comes back to you know how, how we would want to be proceeding with uh, these recommendations moving forward. And I'm not sure if you wanted to add if you want, let Larry to speak as to what our position is here. Okay, I, I'll, I'll try not to go over what Dan has gone over. I will point out that the security here is a little different. It's not a letter of credit. Um, the city, there's a cash escrow. There's 166000 or $167,000 sitting in an escrow account, and it can't be dispersed without the permission of the, uh, of the uh, city. It effectively operates the same as a letter of credit, but it's the developer's money. It's sitting in a three-party agreement between the city, the developer, and a title company. So th there is cash collateral there. The property was originally platted in 2004, and as many of you will remember, the improvements went in and nothing happened. Nothing was ever built. Um, it was a source of considerable consternation to the city for many years that nothing happened there. Um, finally, the developer came back with a plan for a new product, essentially attached villa homes built on the existing footprint. The existing street was in with the first lift of bituminous in place. The city approved that. They uh, for a plat for River Bluff Estate, second edition, that was in 2015. There was a developer's agreement. The developer's agreement is pretty specific that the financial security secures certain specific things including the installation of the second lift of bituminous. The developer was supposed to have done that by August 31st of 2016, didn't do so. Um, the developer's agreement says that the second lift in bituminous has to be done in accordance with the requirements of the city engineer. The issue that we need guidance from and the staff needs guidance from is does council want to get involved in this matter this is not a public street it's a private street we took the security to get the second lift on candidly because the city had had some concerns and there have been performance issues in the past with this development um, most townhome developments um, and row house developments the classic the other example would be the center's row homes uh, uh, are done on private streets. They're primarily done on private streets because of the density and the width of the streets. They can't meet city standards. Um, so the issues concerning the improvement and the maintenance and the ongoing responsibility of those streets aren't city issues. Uh, the developer's agreement clearly states these aren't city streets. They're never going to be city streets. <coughs> 
could the city declare a default under the developer's agreement? Uh, I understand what Dan is saying, and I think you could probably say yes. Likely, a pretty significant dispute is going to ensue. So the issue right here for the council is, does the city want to get involved in what is inherently a private street matter? Recognizing that the past council with eyes wide open made sure it took security to get the second lift on because it was a concern at the time. Um, from a conversation that Dan and I had last week, he, maybe you can talk, Dan, about what you estimate the cost of reclaiming, re replacing the first lift and putting in a corrected second lift would be. That's probably something relevant for the council. Sure. Uh, you know, we, we would ballpark, we don't have exact numbers or quotes, but just a ballpark that the wear and course uh, final lift might might be a 40, 40 to $50,000 issue for the developer. That, so they might have something uh, like that in their minds uh, if they're to just go finish up, uh, finish up the wear and course. Excuse uh, me, Dan. That was forty or fifty thousand dollars for the wear course. Yeah, for, for the wear course. Without replacing. Without the base. doing anything else. Got it. Yep. Uh, and so that that's probably their expectation somewhere around there. Uh, if if they were to do what we think would be appropriate and typical for your your uh, you know typical public street, it might might be in the neighborhood of one hundred fifty. So there's going to be a very big discrepancy, uh, and that will definitely get their attention. And that, as Larry indicated, that they would probably not, well, I can't speculate, but I would assume that they're not going to take that lane down and say, yep, okay. Uh, and so I, I think that what we're getting at is this this could be a, a disputed issue. And, uh, you know, how, how do we, how do we take, take our position on a private street matter and in some respects, we could say we're assisting and offering guidance. If it gets to the point where we're not approving their wearing course and taking $160,000 out, I mean, I, I think Larry would really have to explain how that would play out. The second part of Dan's comment is a whole separate issue because at that point, the city, there, there are different levels of city involvement. Um, I mean, under the developers under a typical developers agreement on a public street if the developer defaults and doesn't build it I mean could the city ultimately pull down on the collateral the letter of credit go in and actually build and fix the street itself yes mm -hmm. um, this one's a little different because the security is ostensibly for the second lift and it's a private street so there are sort of levels of city involvement one potential level of city involvement would be telling the developer effectively what Dan is saying and saying we're not releasing the cash collateral to escrow until this gets resolved, which might be a first step. Other steps, under the terms of the developer's agreement, the city has the right, including in this developer's agreement, the city has the right, if it determines there's a default, to refuse to issue certificates of occupancy. That is an exceedingly penal remedy because usually in that case, the units, the home is sold, and you've got somebody new moving into the community, and you're not going to give a CO so they can't move into a house that they've sold, probably have already got mortgage financing and everything else. Sure. That one's really aggressive, and I'd be cautious about using that. I will tell you that in my career, I put that in my developer's agreement. I've never used it unless there was a problem with a particular unit or a house, you know, where we said no. The developer's agreement also says you don't have to issue building permits if there's a default. Now, that's a different remedy because, and there are still several unbuilt lots up there. Um, I didn't do an exact count when I looked at it. Um, but that's also something the city could do as a means to attempt to get the developer's attention. Could we use that for leverage? Yes, you could. I mean, the issue is how far does the city want to get involved in a private street matter? You know, typically, uh, the, the city attorney will say uh, these are private matters, these are private property right matters, and the city shouldn't be involved. Candidly, when the second phase of this development came in, the city was concerned. That's part of the reason we have the, that's part of the, reason we have the cash security. Um, so I, I don't like cities getting involved in private street matters, but I think it's a policy decision the council needs to make as to how far you want to go. Can I ask a question about 
a couple steps farther down the road. So the first option you described where the city says, I'm not going to release the cash escrow until this issue is resolved, right? And let the developer propose right. a resolution. So let's say the developer proposes the resolution. They're just going to put that second code on and done and not replace the base layer. So we're saying as a city that doesn't meet the city engineer's requirements, is that a violation then of the developer agreement? Oh, that's, what, that's when the argument's going to ensue. Okay. And you know, that's where, you know, depending on where this goes, you know, we could end up litigating this. Okay. So let's set that aside. So let's just say that they put that second code on there, which the city engineer has said if, we, if the developer does that, it's going to last maybe a year. There's going to be more problems with that street. Since it's a private street, what does the homeowners association have to deal with that? It's their issue. It's their issue. It's not ours. I absolutely understand, but is, and I don't know about the homeowners association agreement, but they, I assume that typically a homeowners association would then have to work with the developer to get that street repaired. How would they go about doing that? I can't. I can't speculate on what the HOA would do, but yes, that would be a dispute between the HOA and the developer. Okay, all right. I mean, the, the, the practical issue is the city's holding money, and as Council Member Henry said, there are some leverage aspects to this. Sure. And I'm not, it's, you know, we're, yeah. <coughs> this is a dicey act because it's not a public street, sure. but we are holding cash collateral because there were concerns that issues may arise with getting improvements and right. so on there. And we wanted to prevent that. Yeah, understand. Go ahead. Could we communicate anything that would create a timeline? You know, asking them to have, whether it be a base coat or the more recommended done at a certain amount of days? We, we certainly can. I mean, the developer's agreement required them to put the second lift on by August 31st of 2016, and they didn't do that. Okay. I didn't realize that. And we haven't done anything or threatened anything because of that. So when you said the city. Yeah. Right. That I can't speak to. Okay. You said the developer was required to put the second? The second lift of bituminous was supposed to be on by August 31st of 2016. So basically they defaulted they on that to? agreement. But the, if they didn't do it, like who are they accountable to? Back to the HOA. Since they didn't do that at the 216 deadline, who are they accountable to for it? Is it well, back to the, the HOA? Well, that established by the city that, within the developer's agreement for them to do that. And they defaulted on that. They have not done that. That's correct. And that, I, I, I want to be careful because I'm, not, I'm the city attorney and not the city engineer, but I believe the city engineer has some thoughts about what may have happened to the wear course or the base course because the wear course wasn't put on and you might want to talk about that. And that's a really yeah, that, that doesn't help the issue because it, it, I would really speculate that the, the base was just beat up with a lot of the construction activities. It was sitting there for eight years and generally speaking, you don't want to let it sit for indefinitely because it's not much pavement and that's a lot of heavy equipment on it. So I'd say it broke up, you know, it's, it's, it's already in the, on the stages of failure at this point from all that activity. So yeah, that, that wasn't ideal. It, ex it expedited the, the, the failures yeah. of the street. And ultimately, I think it results in the, the HOA would end up having to pick up additional maintenance costs uh, versus had the street been put in in, a, in in the proper fashion. I think that's ultimately what this comes down to is if it gets done ideally, the, the developer's paying a lot more than he's expected to and he's expecting to, and if, you, if it doesn't get done you know, the right way, the HOA would end up uh, picking up the maintenance costs, thus, thus the challenge here. So I just have a couple of questions regarding the, the timeline. I, is it safe to say that the pavement didn't degrade in the last two years, that this was a longer process, and I'm kind of referring to that August 31st, 2016 deadline? Yeah, I mean, I, I would I would say from from the information that we have, it it wasn't the first four years where it started to break up. If pavement isn't touched, it's generally not gonna not gonna show the types of cracking that it's it's shown right now. Okay. So I would say the the last last two to three years, when whenever the heavy equipment was on it, 
was probably where it started to, to fail the way it did because that, that type of cracking is, is it's atypical of, of pavement just sitting there okay. untouched. Why didn't we on September 1st of 2016 have a conversation with the developer? Did we? I guess I'm just kind of curious a little bit of the historical knowledge on this and why, why and how this came to be an issue right now. Pardon? We had a different engineer at the time. Well, typically in a smaller development like this, you won't see the final, <coughs> kind of to the city engineer's comments, you won't see that final wear course until the majority of the blacktop or the majority of the home construction is completed. So it's a um, kind of a one-off in that that black top, the base course was put down so long ago so that so that length of time contributed to the breakup of the base course. But if you would have laid down the wear course on this, you'd basically be having the same problem, but it'd just be the wear course that would be crumbling and not the base course. So it would have compounded the problem. So I can't, I don't recollect the, the conversation, but just based on past practice with the uh, prior city engineer and city planner that was that's typically how the city will handle an issue like that there are um, every single development agreement we put uh, deadlines for um, blacktop and etc uh, then quite typically the city engineer and city planner along with probably the building official public services director etc there'll be a conversation about should should this be extended in order to uh, create a better uh, infrastructure product um, that again though based on when this was put in and the fact that they're private streets there's a there is I grant you there's a unique set of circumstances here okay. and then the HOA brought it up to us most recently correct the uh, uh, residents who are within the HOA asked the city for um, basically some advice or an interpretation um, and so I offered to have the city engineer do a report and so this is the report that the city engineer has prepared um, in kind of developing the narrative for this, uh, looked at the developer's agreement, uh, which provides some context for the escrow um, and some additional pieces for the council to consider. Well, I would think that, I'm sorry, I just have one more question. Um, so Larry, does putting together this report, does this put us in a liability issue of not if we choose not to hold their feet to the fire, that we're aware of the, mm. the poor condition of this pavement? The developer's agreement clearly obligates the developer to install the second lift. We're totally within our rights on that. The developer's agreement says it has to be done in conformance with the requirements of the city engineer. I mean, I think we've got, a, we certainly have a leg to stand on to require that um, and, and to say they have to do it. The, and this would be certainly much clearer if it was a city street. The issue is we're intervening as the city into a private property manner, um, matter. But candidly, that's part of the reason that the city took the security here. Um, I mean, the streets and the utilities were already in, but there had been problems in the past. Okay. <clears throat> I'm done. Do we do the snow removal? So they handle all the snow removal, so everything that's done on that property is to the homeowners association. Correct. Well, my feeling is it's still lipstick on a pig if they just put their wear course over the top of the base course, because that's going to crack exponentially fast. Mm -hmm. I think, and the homeowners first recourse is going to go to the homeowners association. But inevitably, it's going to end up here, and there, somebody, or it's going to end up. Brent's going to hear it. The city attorney's going to hear it. Um, I'd like to get in front of it. I'd like to see the roads fixed first. I think the base coast should be tear off and put on. But is that the city's responsibility Correct. to orchestrate that? You're saying yes. My that was a question mark. Sorry, and I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. If the developer's just going to go and put a wear course on, 
Um, and then they're going to expect to have their escrow basically um, released to them. And in two years, that road's going to be, it's going to be bad. And I understand the, the private road versus a public street, but it's basically a new development per se. I mean, yeah, it's 14 years of, of asphalt, the wear court or the, uh, the base court, um, that's just been exposed to the elements and just there's frost and heave and that's going to destroy them. I mean, you can look at the road, any streets that are public in 14 years. I mean, just look at sixth street, sixth street's a mess too, but we will take care of that one day. <laughs> um, but that's going to be a base course issue too. It's, I don't know. I think that we should somehow use some type of leverage to make sure that the base course gets completed first. Mayor Council, if I could, there's basically two choices that you have. You could, one, you could just forward the letter onto the HOA and the developer as a FYI and let them resolve the issue as they determine. Or two, you could direct the city attorney and city engineer to prepare a letter that would, in essence, tell the developer that the city's expectation is that is that the base course and wear course go in per the city engineer's recommendation, which is in this packet that the, ba the, the base course agreement. be reclaimed, then the additional base course be put on, and then the uh, wear course be put on after that. But I think that would be, it would get us a good start to frame it in terms of those two choices. Sure. So I guess I would like to amend option B that you presented, Brent, because my biggest concern with this is that my concern is that if the city doesn't do something and hold the developer accountable for the developer agreement, why do we even have them, right? This can be applied to any other development within Carver, right? Why is the city not holding up, holding the developers to their agreements with the city? That's kind of my base concern here. Um, and so that letter being saying this is the city's recommendation is to replace the base course and apply then apply the wear course to be compliant with the agreement and fulfill the agreement that we had with the developer. Joy, I, <clears throat> excuse me, well said. I think that mirrors at least what I was thinking with myself. I think it is, is it isn't prudent for us to just throw the HOA to the wolves and say, right. you're on your own. Because we did miss deadlines. There are, are mm -hmm. in the agreement, things that were supposed to be done, taken care of, haven't been. I think that what you stated, the second option, is what I would prefer. I'm right there with you. So I'm feeling kind of based on precedent that I've been aware of. So I'm kind of thinking back to the lift station from the, help me with the name of the neighborhood. Uh, Carver Bluffs West. Carver Bluffs West. Um, when they had some issues, instead of kind of s stepping in and managing that process, we as a city declined to participate in that. And I think I'm kind of coming from a place, this is a private, private street. I do understand where you're coming from and the developer's agreement and why have them. Um, and that's... I think probably a different, more defensible argument, because um, the impression that I am getting from our city attorney is that it's going to be at best a slippery slope to enforce, um, and I am favoring because of that option one of just sharing with the HOA because it's a private street. That's where I come from. If I'm not mistaken. The lift station was in the developer's agreement that the homeowners association was responsible for it. Correct, just like the street. It was in the developer's agreement. Mm -hmm. That being said, we stayed out of it. A. It's a it's a totally sold out development, and they're responsible for it. This still has lots available in there. Um, and it's been 14 years since that course was put down. Has there been any other 
um, street maintenance up in the bluffs where this area, where the lift station and stuff that the home that the homeowners association has to take care of themselves to kind of make it apples to apples. Yeah, I'll give it to you that it's not an apples to apples issue, but I, you know, there are other private streets. I just, it, where I'm coming from is this is private and I don't see it as the city's role to step in. You know, what, if there's a big snowfall and their snowfall contractor doesn't show, do we start plowing the streets? Like, right. where do we? Yeah, and, and uh, not to interrupt that's you, but. That's a horrible example, but. but. But I totally understand what you're saying. I guess just to clarify my position a little bit is the, the, the second layer is part of the basic development. That's where I'm coming from. So let's say the developer did everything they were supposed to do per the agreement, get the second layer, layer on there by 2016. And let's say because they let it go for so many years with that base layer and there was damage and even per the city engineer's recommendation, that, that second wear coat, even if it had been put on a couple years ago, may not last very long. And let's say the HOA comes back and says, hey, we got problems with this road now. Then I think I would say, you know what, this is a private matter. Yep. The developer met the agreement initially for the development, the basic requirements of the development were out. This is a private matter between the HOA and the developer. That's how I would feel about it. It's just because this is, in my mind, part of the basic development agreement between the city and the developer for the development. They didn't fulfill the their, they the didn't basic. fulfill the, the, the agreement. Yeah. And it, I think it would just be like lipstick on a pig. Because sooner or later it's going to go. And more sooner than later. Brett, do you want a motion from us tonight? <coughs> do you want this to go through, or does this need to be on another? I think it would be helpful just because of kind of the, how this might play out, and especially if there's not uh, unanimous consensus, I'd like to have clear direction in the form of a motion so that we c I can work with uh, Larry and Dan to make sure this is put out correctly. Can you repeat the, the no, but I mean, repeat the um, the language that you need in that motion. Sure, so I, I'll kind of base. the second one was very long. I'll base it <laughs> off uh, Council Member McKnight's um, kind of phraseology, if that's a word, the, that we direct, that the council would be directing the city engineer and city attorney to prepare correspondence that would require the developer to um, meet the requirements of the developer's agreement, uh, specifically the reclamation of the existing base course and then paving a new base course and wear course. I would like to make that motion, but I would like to not try and repeat it. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a motion by council member Mock. I would like to second that. We have a second by council member McKnight. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. And we'll do a roll call. Council Member Henry. Aye. Council Member Mock. Aye. Mayor Johnson. Nay. Council Member Sayer. Aye. Council Member McKnight. Aye. Thank you. All right. Motion passes. On to 9.2, the 2019 street improvements. Do you want to pull up your slide? Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Larry. So, Mayor and Council, we on the screen, this is kind of a, um, a reboot of our work session discussion held earlier this evening on the 2019 project. Uh, where we left off from the city engineer's comments um, was a the sidewalk discussion on Kirchy Hill. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Council Member Mock. Thank you, and thank you everyone for allowing me the time to um, talk about this. Brent, could you click on that triangle parcel there just so we can kind of orient ourselves? Thank you. So obviously we've been going through the discussion about the street improvements and we've been talking about sidewalks as part of the project for um, Kirsch Hill Drive and Diedrich. Um, I was reviewing some of the um, obviously aerial photos in the area and it occurred to me that if you look to 
the left of the screen, you can see a curved trail there and where the um, former road easement is. That trail right there comes out from Community Park and then it dumps into High Street. So we have a, a trail to nowhere. Um, the street, or excuse me, the parcel across the street, which is highlighted in yellow, um, is actually a city owned piece of property. We are talking about, so I'll reference this, I'll bring this all back together. If we're looking at going down Kershey Hill and then Diedrich Drive to 4th Street with the new proposed trail section as part of that street improvement project, we would also be creating another trail section that dumps straight into a road. It's another sidewalk or pedestrian access to nowhere. Now, when we had talked about this at a previous meeting, I know that Councilmember Johnson and Councilmember Henry, who were here, the other two, <laughs> you guys were not here, had talked about connectivity as being the main reason behind wanting to put these um, sidewalks down Kershey and Diedrich. When we're talking about connectivity, um, another piece that was mentioned by the former mayor was that being able to have that connect into the downtown. I can't remember if that was um, agreed, uh, an agreed sentiment with everyone else on the council at the time. But I know that it was brought up to be able to move tr foot traffic from up at Community Park and these upper neighborhoods to the downtown. So when we're looking at adding these new sidewalks in, we are looking at, we have, in, historically I should say, we have talked about having as as few as possible and keeping it to a minimum that we would have um, sidewalks or pedestrian access ways or trails that would lead into an uncontrolled intersection. So now we have one that is coming to an uncontrolled intersection coming off of the trail system by the yellow triangle. We would be adding another uncontrolled trail section or pedestrian section on the same place, basically on High Street. This one is a little bit off of High. So my question, and I guess thought process is rather than running the trail down Kershey Hill and Diedrich, if connectivity is what we are really after and we want to move people to the 4th Street sidewalk, because if we're, we're going to Diedrich Drive, the reason there's a curb cut put there for the sidewalk is to move people across the street to the sidewalk that could lead them into downtown. We already have basically that same thing a block up the road. We could connect the sidewalk that is coming down Kershey, have it come down either side of High Street, and then either connect with the trail or they can both connect into that city-owned piece of property that's on the yellow triangle. Then we would continue to have one section of an uncontrolled intersection crossing for a sidewalk rather than adding an additional one. Um, I guess I wanted to bring that up as a thought process that we could look at it from that little bit bigger scope of not just bringing it through that one neighborhood, but how are we going to connect then community park and not adding, adding another, I don't, wanna, I don't know, problem is the right word, but adding another problem, I'll say that for now for lack of coming up with a better one in my cold medicine haze, but um, so I think we should look at possibly connecting, we have a trail section there, like I said, that goes to nowhere and we have the opportunity to connect it um, to 4th Street already. Thank you. So if I may, um, I just think my initial feedback on that is, is that does nothing. So first of all, it's outside of the project area, right? So we would have to amend that. Mm -hmm. And this isn't an area we're talking about. I appreciate you giving this some thought and kind of thinking about different ways that we can look at this and connectivity. Um, that's important to me and I appreciate you putting the thought and time into that. That said, um, the th I still favor the sidewalk going down Kirchy, then to Dietrich and then connecting across 4th Street there and my reasoning is this. Um, I think if we connect, if we cross 4th Street there, there's a significant curve in 4th Street there um, which is not as safe as the straightaway where it is a little bit further to the, what would be, that be, the west, um, or I'm sorry, the east, uh, yeah, northeast. Um, there's also, you talked about a trail to nowhere. Well, right now we already have a sidewalk to nowhere, which borders my property at Kirchie and 4th Street. Um, so to have, that does nothing to, ha to amend that sidewalk to nowhere. I think um, 
you know, these homes back here have young kids that doesn't do anything to give these folks a safe place to walk, to teach their kids how to ride a two-wheeler. Um, and it's my preference still to have the sidewalk down Kirchie and then Dietrich and then connecting on Dietrich. That way too, you're not crossing Kirchie, which is one cross, then you're co crossing 4th Street, which is another, and then you're crossing 4th Street again to get downtown. It would be... I'm confused. I'm sorry. Say that again. So the trail, you cross High Street, and then you cross 4th Street, so it's three, and then... Sorry. Cross High Street, you cross 4th, and then you have to cross 4th again to get down the hill on a sidewalk. Um, with this, you go from Kirchie to Dietrich without crossing a street, and then, while not my favorite, you've got to cross 4th Street twice to get downtown. But that's a snap, snapshot in time, and potentially that would change. Right, so However, we, again, outside of the project yeah, scope yeah. that we're it looking is at right now. But I don't want to blinder ourselves either saying, well, we no. have, we're just going to push through because this is where we're at. I think if we were to decide that this is something we want to change in the project scope, or we say it's for a different time project scope because technically it doesn't have to connect in, that we can change it. We have, it. I mean, yeah. So I, think I don't want to push things through for saying, right. well, we've started this path and we're just, we yeah. have to stay. Yeah. I agree, I agree. Uh, the other thing though that concerns me a little bit is that with it, kind of in the vein of this being outside the project scope, um, these folks in this project area aren't going to be assessed for the sidewalks. Their assessment will not raise or lower mm -hmm. if we take these sidewalks out. Right. These That's folks true. who you're suggesting the sidewalk go on, and again, taking myself out of the equation, will be assessed. So we're adding four more mm. folks who wouldn't have been assessed. If it were be, to, let's just say it were to be added to this project, if the city, if if the city technically as a whole is paying for the sidewalk that would go on Kershey, would that be the same for going along high? Well, the, the mayor and council, the section <coughs> that you'd be putting on high would be on city property. So there wouldn't be, if we were looking at where the yellow triangle is. I think she's oh, advocating I'm, putting it the left. I'm just saying if we went. She was talking about running it from Kirchy down to 4th we Street were, on not, High not Street. I'm not necessarily advocating. I'm just saying if we were to look at that were object, were, or, sorry, look option, would the city as a whole be paying for that sidewalk the same as if it were on Kirchy? Or would the homeowner now suddenly be a. No, I would say. I would say that in most cases, you're, we, we, the city would not be able to show a benefit of just putting a sidewalk to the point where you'd be able to establish an assessment. Um, We'd probably, if you're asking me to speculate, we'd be in the same situation where there are folks might, kind of similar to Kirchy and Dietrich, where what side of the street should that sidewalk be on? Should it be on the east side of high or the west side of high? Sure. But, but, yeah. but the, I mean, you would more than likely want to <coughs> want to do that, and you could establish funds to do that, do it outside of the project, because the, when the council sits the uh, parameters for the project there's a public hearing and so you designate certain areas where those projects can right. occur um, but <clears throat> a stretch of sidewalk that small you could certainly find another source of funding beyond bond funds to, to fund that if the council so cho chose to do that. and I'm and thank you Brent and I'm not saying I necessarily want to trade one like one fight for another I just want to look at this as the overarching picture if we're looking at connectivity then let's really look at it so I agree with Mayor Johnson's, all her comments regarding the sidewalk on Kirchie. I'm totally on board with all those reasons to put it there as it's designed in the proposed plan. Um, but I also agree with you that we need to think bigger picture. So one of my questions is I know we did as a city a task force on walkability and I know we identified gaps. It would be great if we're cognizant of those gaps and look at some of the proposed, like Brent is proposing, hey, look at a special, special funds to close some of those gaps. Or when we're having projects working on those areas, say, hey, we identified that we wanted to put a trail here. We want to make a connection here. Let's do it with some other things. It would be great to have that. Do we have that? <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm making a lot of assumptions here. We should here. be doing this. Are we doing this by the next meeting, please? So we do have a sidewalk budget within the 
general fund. And there is, you know, it's kind of ironic. There are, there are two areas that uh, Brian Skolk and I discussed last summer related to gaps in our system. One was we noticed that there was, especially for school events, when mm. folks parked in Carver Station, they were trailblazing where there wasn't a sidewalk or a trail to get to the corner of Ironwood and Hartwell. So they're yeah. cutting across grass. And so um, Brian facilitated a, um, the construction of a basically a blacktop trail from the corner of Carver Station <laughs> over to the trail system where Ironwood and Hartwell meet so that people could go from the parking lot to that corner. And the second area, and this was um, just something that I've noticed in walking this area is that to Council Member Mock's point, there is a sidewalk to nowhere coming out of Community Park. And is that another area that we could just extend that trail at least to get folks across the fourth? Uh, we just didn't have the funds to do that at that time. Sure. <clears throat> But you know, th this could be kind of a preview into one of our future agenda items for this evening. We're looking at our strategic plan as look, looking back at that report, identifying mm -hmm. gaps in our system, um, prioritizing them, and then finding funding sources to do that because I, there's probably a half a dozen or more other places that sure. have gaps yep. uh, that could be rectified. Good. I'm glad. I'd like to take that. Christy's suggestions and add it to kind of that list of the connectivity. Um, rather, and then I'd like to see this project just stay more focused on the infrastructure, the s improvements on street and sidewalk that we've already prioritized. I'm not sure if I'm hearing you correctly. So you, you want to stay focused on what was already presented as the as the um, plan. I yes. Guess. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, um, as far as the connectivity, um, I want to make sure or to clarify question. So the triangle that's highlighted, mm -hmm. I mean that is really small, 0.78, less than a tenth of an acre, but it <laughs> is adjacent to that home property. That town line road is not there. Correct. Gilfil. Correct, it's Gilfillan, but it's it's a right away for Gilfillan that hasn't been improved other than having okay. the city trail. In okay, it. and the homeowners are maintaining it and they're maintaining the city outlet. Correct. Okay. Um, I would like to see added to this idea of more, you know, the connectivity is where that trail ends. I wish I had a pointer right now. But, um, <laughs> I know I'm pointing I have it on the my cursor. screen. Yeah, yeah. I um, so I'd it. say. Uh, <laughs> The trail ends. Well, right at yeah. Right, right where he's going. Yes, to right where your cursor is, and then to go south on High Street. South. South. <laughs> the other south. And then, and then kind of southwest on Fourth Street, because if you get down further, there is, you would There's connect to three sidewalks and a crosswalk. Oh boy. Yeah. If we oh, you're saying to run it up that, yeah, on that move. side of. Yeah. Or, yep. West. And yep. I mean that. Ah, yes. yes, there we go. Because Here. then you would have, you'd be connecting to three sidewalks. And a stop sign. Ah. And a crosswalk. A stop sign at this intersection here. Yep. That would be a, certainly be a safer crossing than crossing 4th Street right on that curve. That visibility is yeah. tough on the curve on High Street. I yes. can testify that to said, that. I think kind of in line with what Brent was saying about the, the path that was put in from the parking lot of Carver mm -hmm. Station. These are small amounts of sidewalk right. that still cost big bucks. So we can cross that bridge when we come to it. But yeah, I think we were thinking more so in my Brent, mind. Can projects. you take but that triangle and put it down at the bottom of the screen and slide it to the left? Pull it down. Can you say that metal part first? <laughs> take, take the whole, there you go. There there you go. go. Move it down, down, left. down, down, and left. <laughs> A little bit more. And down, 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 right there. Okay. You can't quite see it. Um, more down, more left. On Fourth Street, on Fourth Street at um, at what's the street? Elm and Fourth. Where the sidewalk? Or the no, no, no. Where Daryl lives, on the hill. Ash. Ash. There's there's a trail crossing there. Correct. 
at an uncontrolled intersection. Half of it is. There's a stop sign coming down. There's not one going up. It's a two-way stop, correct? Correct. So there is, for the people coming up, there's still, they don't have to stop, and that's, uh, there's a trail crossing there, marked in white, going across the street. Correct? Like the sidewalk ends on what I would call the south side, and you have to go on the St. Nicholas side to go up fourth. If you're at the corner of fourth and Ash Street, there's two stop signs one coming up Ash, one coming down fourth. Correct? Correct. There is not one coming up at, the, at that intersection. Right. There is a trail crossing there. Yes. Marked in white. Correct? Yes. Are we going to mark the streets um, if we move forward with this at Dietrich and Forest Street with a trail paint? Like a hash marked crossing? You're talking you about a crosswalk asking, would you or, or like the, the signs blocks, that say the white blocks crossing? to indicate trail crossing? That's what you're asking. Well, would we mark the street? It's the council's prerogative. I mean, we, in... The higher traffic areas will have signage and have crosswalk blocks, but we don't have crosswalk blocks. At no, not blocks, just just um, the white paint on the street marking a, marking a trail crossing. I think you're saying the same thing. Crosswalk. Yeah. <laughs> Correct. Crosswalk. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Would we put one of those at Dietrich and 4th Street? Do you want to? I would suggest it. We'll do whatever you uh, the council asks us to do. Yes. Well, if if we're going to direct traf uh, pedestrian traffic to a dead end, mm -hmm. there should be. I'll de I'll defer to the city engineer. He's <laughs> he knows more about this than I do. Um, this is a pretty pretty big topic just because it's it's had lots of review and and they do advise that generally speaking that uh, in in uncontrolled cross crossing locations. Under certain circumstances here, you'll, you'll, you would actually not stripe it, and that's only, only to give the pedestrians more caution as they enter into the street. So uh, there's certain certain levels in which you want the pedestrian to be more worried about walking out there. Is is the theory, and it, they they have shown that there's some safety advantages to the to the peds not feeling comfortable walking out into the street because. Uh, they they feel like they have an entitlement to be there when the crosswalk blocks are there, and so it, it's it's carefully evaluated based on the speeds of the traffic and and how much traffic is going down the street as to whether or not we'd mark it. So that that's that's the I guess the technical rationale based on some of the data that's out there on on pet safety. I oh, I'm um, for now. Um. So I would like to say I think that most of the council knows that I have spoken out against the sidewalk on Kirchy Hill Drive in the past. Um, when I look at this and we're looking at that it, we, are at, we are including a sidewalk now for only six houses. The Diedrich Drive that kind of comes around that curve in the back, they don't have sidewalk. There isn't sidewalk coming down the other piece of um, oh, Diedrich, sorry, all the way around. And then... Um, so we, we are not providing sidewalks for that group, but we are providing it for the people on Kirsch Hill and making that um, a priority, saying that needs a sidewalk. But we're looking at the other one, two, three, four, five, six, um, seven, eight, nine, ten, and the other side of the road. I mean, you're looking at, I'll just say 15 houses that we seem unconcerned with providing them with a sidewalk. And yet these six houses have somehow become a very big focus for having the sidewalk there. Um, uh, I'm not sure why looking at having them cross possibly earlier um, or not at all in this either of these two locations is not a better option. Um, again, we're not providing the sidewalk to, to the neighborhoods that are around Dietrich Drive, and we're saying that's okay. But we're saying Kirsch Hill must have it for connectivity. And I just, that, that logic doesn't work with me. Um, and I do think we're, we're pushing something through 
with this urgency, but although it's only, I mean, it's, it's six houses that we're doing it, and again, it's uncontrolled intersections. When I hear the en engineers say, sometimes we don't stripe it because we want people to be uncomfortable, I get the methodology behind that and how that works, but that frightens me a little bit to say we want people to be uncomfortable crossing in a road. We don't want to make it them to feel too safe, that they are actually more on guard when they're crossing, worries me a little bit more also. Um, I think I can leave it at that for now. I think peop everyone knows my kind of stance on the Kershey Hill sidewalk. My not concern is you're just basically stating now that everybody that we're doing the whole project for doesn't need a sidewalk. Well, on all the trails that we have throughout the town, it's not everybody that's just in that immediate area that's on the trails. I mean, when I walk, I'll walk. But when I get to the sidewalk to nowhere and I'm going downtown, I got to walk in the street. I'm not going to walk back to the park to go down the trail to cut down and cross 4th Street at the intersection that you pointed out at the tribe. No, that's not, doesn't make sense. It's not common sense. You want to have flow with people. You want to have a little bit of continuity and you want to make a connectability. We did the walkability study. Mm -hmm. We were, the plan is to make it sustainable for everybody to be able to walk through town to get from A to B, whether it's up, down, midtown, wherever. We mandate that people have trails in the new, in the new developments. We're redoing the streets. We're getting everything up to code. The houses that are back there will use the sidewalks on Kirchie. They will use them on Dietrich, on that short little strip, if they're there. If they're not there, you're just saying, sorry, you're gonna walk out in the street. Because they will walk from there, from High Street, over to Forest Street, and across the road, whether there's a sidewalk there or not. Now they're in the street, not on the sidewalk. I'd rather have people walking on the sidewalk. It's a lot safer. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't have people walking down 6th Street in the middle of the street. There's a trail there. And I would, for me, the difference between the two roads, right, why we're not having a sidewalk on Dietrich versus Kirchie Hill, is that Kirchie Hill connects to 6th Street, right? That's kind of a connector through there. And it's got sidewalk all the way from 6th Street up until, you know, the first house or whatever past High Street, and then it ends, right? So it's kind of going to nowhere. Um, and Dietrich ends in kind of a, I don't know, I guess I'd call it a cul-de-sac. I'm looking at a map, but it kind of dead ends. It's a dead end cul-de-sac. Right, so they're kind of different the streets in my mind. One is more of a connector that has an existing sidewalk on, I don't know, a couple blocks of it and missing it on one block. I believe the term is a feeder street. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and Christy, I know I'm not going to change your... Yeah mind on this and I appreciate our difference of opinions but uh, you know you mentioned that trail to nowhere there's literally the sidewalk to nowhere and keeping it going down Kirchie having it serve as a connector between 4th and 6th street keeping it on that southwest side of Dietrich then we don't have again if we put it on the north east side then there wouldn't have been another sidewalk to nowhere you know in my mind this is the best possible scenario to, you know, we talk about having a walkable city, the connectivity study, the walkability study. This is helping us get further with that. Um, and I think you're thinking that this is only going to benefit six homes is a, I respectfully think it's flawed because my nephews will go up and down that sidewalk. Folks who live on this end of the neighborhood will be able to walk downtown. You know, I've shared before in this forum the antidote of my family being in town and us walking downtown for the tree lighting ceremony. It was no issue when it was still light out to walk down Kirchie, but on the way back up, we walked up 4th Street because we didn't feel safe walking in the dark along Kirchie. I drive home that way, and I've been scared more than a few times when driving home from a council meeting to see somebody out there walking. Um, so I think that this is best for connectivity and best for safety. If I may, switching gears just a little bit, um, at one point, we had, as potentially an option, um, a trail extension along Spring Creek Drive just east of Meadows at Spring Creek. Is that still in play? Correct. It's okay. still in the plans. 
Okay. And nobody's here debating that trip. <laughs> yeah, that fine. We're all good. We're all good, <laughs> we're all good with that section. <laughs> yeah. Wait till so, they move in. All right. So, Mayor and Council, what we're so the summary of the findings is essentially what we're we're asking for the council's uh, support or <clears throat> change in language for the things that we'd be communicating to the residents in this next update. Um, and so if, if the council can ag agree to that or have build some type of consensus to that, you'd still have the opportunity to vote up or, up or down the plans and specifications uh, that the city engineer prepares for their meeting on the 4th, which should, could include sidewalks or s streets. But the f basically the four planks that we'd have within the, the updated summary for residents and then invite them to the uh, open house on the 31st it would be to share that the typical assessment for both the water and sanitary sewer utility uh, would be reduced from 25,000 to 19,200 uh, as it relates to street width, street width to remain as proposed in the feasibility study except Elm Drive uh, based on the fire marshal requirements, uh, parking, parking consistency with adjacent streets uh, would stay the same. So Elm would be widened to 26 feet, uh, but still would be no parking on either side uh, sidewalk, the, the sidewalk on Kirchie would have the eight foot boulevard, or the three foot boulevard with the five foot walk. And that the fourth plank would be the no truck traffic signage for the alley. Um, so those were <coughs> kind of the four pieces that we heard for follow ups. Uh, if you want staff to kind of amend, you know, what we'd be com sharing with the count or sharing with residents, this would be the time to tell us, you know, we want this, we think that's too strong or we want this to be changed. Otherwise, we'll put it out there like that. We'll get the feedback and then ultimately the council can uh, vote on the plans and specs at your meeting on February 4th. And these are just bullets that you went through, right? No truck, you'll expand on that. No truck traffic signage will be installed downtown on the alleyways. The Correct. Okay. All right. So you need a motion. From us, just guidance. Just guidance. Uh, <laughs> I would say just guidance, and the, you know, we wouldn't typically come to you with a, you know, give us your support on a communication. But because we've talked about this in different settings, we want to be sure that we're not putting something out there that the council feels uncomfortable with. So mm -hmm. I just want to make sure if there is something like I don't want that out there that there's an opportunity for you to address that as a group um, and then we can react to that and amend uh, ultimately where I understand there'll be there could be a situation where you don't agree but then I want that just to be kind of on the record that you know the majority of you want this to be a certain way noting that there's going to be an opportunity to vote on that at a later date but I just want to make sure that we have all our T's crossed and I's dotted. I have a couple okay. things. I agree on the content. Um, I think that'd be something great to move forward with. I would like to see it divided out into four projects, um, just because I think those that are most impacted are really gonna just look at theirs and rather than to decipher, okay, what's their street width versus the other project. We can't really break it out as four projects, though, can we? Four explanations. Four explanations. Well, that's different. Sorry, okay. four explanations <laughs> within the project. And then, um, I would like to see more specifics on the signs, so maybe that will be presented at the open house um, as far as where they're located, the size, because um, I, just thinking about what I would anticipate residents asking. Yep, we can do that. There'll be a so Those are my only three things that I'd maybe amend. Otherwise, I think the content is great, but I'd like to see the four pieces of the entire project separated and specifics on the signs. When you say separated, you want them on separate like f individual, like f individual mailings, like per pro like per project, or can I it be all in the same, just separated? I don't think scope? you would need separate mailings. No, just so that organized separately. Yeah. I think the intent is to minimize confusion and question. What, yep. right? and what we'll impacts this project me. on time, <laughs> on schedule? <laughs> right. Yep. Minimize the questions and how do I understand my personal impact? You live here, it impacts you like this. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Well, and that's pretty similar to my feedback. I think that can be just clarified if we're super, and this is getting into the weeds and it's not 30,000 foot level, but it, 
if we're real clear on, you know, for Kirchi and Dietrich, utilities going down to from 25 to 1920. Yeah. Um, I do think we need to specify for the folks who will be affected by no parking on one side or no parking period on Elm and Sunny Ridge to make sure that that's something that's mentioned too. Based on the feedback, we're I'd plan to separate this into two scopes, Kirchi and Dietrich and everything else. I think there's there's enough going on with utilities and the sidewalk mm -hmm. piece um, where there's enough content and there's just a different dynamic than the folks that are on the alleys on Elm and on uh, Sunny Ridge. So. Right. I think that's, that's a good question. Impacted mm -hmm. residents, I think that's fine. I think even the folks on Sunny Ridge and downtown recognize that there's a lot going on with Midtown Carver. I do have another question. Are you, I'm sorry, yeah, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> when we were talking about the sidewalks, um, we were talking about the three foot boulevard and then the five foot walk. Have we looked at having the sidewalk directly curbed to the street as we've had in other areas of town? Do we have any comparison as to what that looks like? Because I, all I think I've seen so far is the three foot boulevard with the five foot walkway. <clears throat> when you when you say what that looks like, can you, are you looking for? Um, well, one, I don't know that it has ever been brought to us even as a consideration. You mean from a visual perspective of what it would look like <laughs> or cost difference or dimensional um, or? Yeah, well, I mean, what, what it's going to look like dimensionally because I think we, I mean, we need to consider that it is impactful to the people and the residents on the street. Um, whether I think it should be there or not, if it does end up going in, I think we should have looked at all the options that are possible. And we have other streets in Carver that are built. I mean, Broadway is the same way. Broadway is built up with the curb that goes right to mm -hmm. the street. Yeah. Um, and is there a way that we can look at that as an option, um, removing that boulevard and having that? And then we have a little less impact on the homeowners yeah, I, I, we, tr we tried to address it, but let me break back to the slides here. So, so I think, let me just talk through, kind of, I know you're trying to blur. <laughs> um, and I'm really glad I'm not sitting next to you. So, um, I'm glad Thank I'm over you. here. <laughs> you can, you can nope. if you want. Nope, 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 I'm good, I'm good, I'm really good. So, but I think the intent here is to I mean, we want to get buy-in from residents at this open house, right? That's ultimately the goal, because we want to move forward with this project, mm -hmm. right? And so we don't want to get hung up on a sidewalk, per se. And so if we are able to show another option that may be more amenable to residents, but still have sidewalk from a connectivity perspective, which is our goal. With the least amount of impact on the residents. Right, and showing them an option, does that, you know, I think is the intention then that hopefully we could get better buy-in versus this is our only sidewalk option and I don't like it, it's taking up too much space. I think if we're going to look at having that, putting that sidewalk into an existing neighborhood, I think we need to look at the best compromises we can. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that having to, to take a look at it that way um, is is the good option. Okay. And it, it may help the residents buy into a sidewalk period, right, which is I think what we want from a connectivity perspective, but gives them another option on a design that may be less impactful to right. them as a homeowner. Thank you. Okay. So I hear you, um, and I know it's contrary to your – your experience, but I feel like if you have the sidewalk right next to the street, that is where all of that heavy snow that gets deposited by the snow plows is gonna be all the time for the width of your property. So that's my concern with putting it there. There's nowhere for snow removal. That said, if that's what the residents want, understanding that it's their duty to remove the snow regardless of how heavy it is after every snowfall I'm fine with placing it there I don't know that we're at the point in the process where we give the residents the option a or option B mm. I think that we present them with the option that we have it here and then we get feedback from folks and if the feedback is we'd rather have it scooched over then we can look at going in that direction 
does, Aaron, this might be a question for you. Does the boulevard in this um, typical section here, does that wipe out all the trees that are along that side of the road or does that keep them? Or Brian, okay. <laughs> Um, I, I think once we get into the plan a little bit more, and Dan can probably um, talk a little bit about it too, is we did look at how that lays out with some of the trees and stuff, and some of them will have to go, some will be able to stay, but it's still kind of in that planning design stage to really determine what the uh, impacts are going to be with trees. Well, if we know that the street is going to be, if we're looking at the uh, whatever width it is, and we overlay that on the project, we, we, should have, we should have some idea where those sidewalks are going on that overlay, correct? Engineer, next next in line. <laughs> There's three maple trees that would get impacted, and I, I don't. Uh, right now, I don't feel we would be saving those if we went to a six foot walk off back a curb. Either it's right, it's right at the base of the trees. And so How about the five foot walk? There, there's de what's that? <laughs> well, we have five feet in here. Are you recommending six if it goes to curb? Yeah, it, it would be hard for me to recommend five foot off the back of the sidewalk, but I mean, certainly, you know, that anything can be considered uh, uh, for. For a, sure. a sidewalk, but and obviously Broadway downtown is a, is a wider si sidewalk because it's our main walkway for businesses. Main Street, where I used to live, has right up to the, the sidewalk goes right to the curb. I don't believe it was six feet. I could be wrong. I have not measured it myself, but yeah, typically we would see eight foot off back of curb, and that gives gives at least three foot for snow storage. If 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 it is going to be off back of curb, and it's usually in a different environment than residential. So uh, that's all I can speak from uh, as far as experiences go. But. And I think when we did the walkthrough last May, the maple trees that you're referring mm -hmm. to, those potentially would be harmed or would have to go more from hookup and where the well is right now and right. where the hookup fees would go versus any depth of the sidewalk, although it would probably be six of one, half a dozen of the other. But okay. And that really is, I, was I know there were some maples. I couldn't remember if there was any other tree line past that they're only about driving through there I've been taking a look and there only seem to be a hand less than a handful a small handful of trees that would but that's a fair in mind not the engineers <laughs> <laughs> a handful of that's not your engineering yeah. well. <laughs> but that's a fair point that we're not just disrupting to put a sidewalk in we're disrupting to put in yep. water sewer yeah 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 okay well I guess for me uh, Courtney I'm you had your opinion about coming with what we have here. Mm -hmm. I would like to have the two different. I would like to have the one that has the option of uh, removal of the boulevard and having the, what is the, what is the term I should be using for the sidewalk right on the curb line? That would be, that would be That's it? That's the one? Okay. <laughs> okay. It's okay. We're not talking insurmountable curbs. <laughs> right. Mr. Engineer, would that be considered, could we bid that as an alternative? Well, I, I, I would say that generally the, the, the intent of an alternative is to capture cost differences. I mean, there would be a very modest cost difference. I would, I would say we could make that change with any amount of direction. What's most important to us is what shows up in the plan because there is expense to, to modifying a plan. Uh, and so, um, yes, you could, but I would say we don't even have to really for the most part. We just have to decide what, what's going to end up in that plan. Okay. I have one question, just so I can get this correct, Councilmember Mark. When you say you, uh, how do you want that? Do you want a visual? Because our, our intent wasn't to, to not show all the options. I just thought it was, I'm not sure what you're looking for. When do I, you want a rendering or do you want, to, if we can provide it. I just want to make sure we get it correct. Sure. I am, um, there's a picture in here that you have a cross section of the sidewalk with the boulevard cut and yeah, it's on slide 20. Yep. I think that if we, I think if we have the alternative option in this scenario, as this our, our picture story to tell. Um, so just a picture that would show the walk right behind the curb. Okay. And I'm sure we'll get uh, many of them that will say they don't want the sidewalk period still. Um, again, they may want to have some opinion on, on which one. So I think it's worth listening to and hearing from them what 
understanding both sides that snow removal becomes what it becomes when the snowplow goes by and see where it goes. If they come I don't agree. That. It's not worth listening to. I just, you oh, know, no, we've, right, no, as someone who's been in the it. walkthrough in the open houses, it seems like the ship has passed for the option A or option B, but that's my opinion. Do you have your direction? <laughs> no, because Courtney and I are still going back so and forth. I support, <laughs> I support presenting the findings as they are. Um, you know, I am not uncomfortable showing the option of the sidewalk butting up the curb. Um, I think it's important to get buy-in on the sidewalk. And to be clear, it's not my opinion of like, Psst, don't say anything about putting the right. sidewalk close. That's definitely something that will come out in conversation during the open house. Oh yeah, absolutely. And will be something. And we that should will be prepared to happen during the next show. What it hearing. Talks, show what it looks yeah. like. Yeah. So yeah. if we're willing to talk about it now, then I'm almost saying why why give out another layer if we if we're willing to talk about it now and it's very possible people are watching. My concern it, right? is with the timeline. We I worry about it pushing us back mm. further. Um, and okay. again. We had these options earlier in this in this process. This is kind of the final. This will be the public hearing. This is for the bids. Um, I just don't think that we're at that point in the process. Yeah, I'm in favor of presenting it this way for all, how far we are in the process. And if, as a visual at the open house, it provides us the opportunity to give them the education on because that was new to me. Why would you want that three foot? Well, snow removal. Um, so I think it. And then there's other you know, positives too, but it gives us the opportunity to have that conversation of why this was recommended. Right. And revisiting the timeline, I mean, we've held a public open house, we've had a public hearing, so we've already had a couple other <coughs> in input points, right? Discussion points. Have we ever looked at the other, has this come up in any of our discussions in the past that you can remember? Um, because I, it really came back as all or nothing. So did we have other options that, was, that were presented to the public in this format with having different other options for the sidewalk? It was, here, we're gonna do the sidewalk. It was either they were very against it or very for it. And did we have something where they have had a chance to look at this compromise of having boulevard curb, or sorry, curb to sidewalk? I think there was a, when we had the open houses, there was a bunch of options discussed, whether it should be behind the curb, a sidewalk at all. Um, I, I understand what you're... I'm just having trouble remembering back. There's been lots of discussion on this. Right. So if anyone has any... No, I remember it was mentioned this. at the public hearing in December, this, December. Yeah, the sidewalk was discussed. I just want to make sure that we're hitting the expectations because I don't want this to be represented that what the city engineer and staff put together is this is what you have to do. We took the information based on, you know, engineering practices, discussion with the fire marshal, et cetera, maintenance. Right. This is what we're recommending. It doesn't mean you have to do this. There are other options. In the presentation of it, some of it we feel is self-evident that, you know, if you take out the middle boulevard, that's where the sidewalk would go, but we can, we can add additional these, you know, we had, we could have had 60 slides here. I mean, we can, we can put it the way that yeah. you want it. We can present it the way that you want it. This is your project. So if you want us to show the walk out or in, uh, we can show, we can show visuals at the open house with different boulevard widths. Um, ultimately my direction to, to Dan and his team was, um, I was, I'm trying to put the, the top candidates, you know, at the top, um, because you could be in a position where it's, let's just use a different issue about parking and what side of the street parking goes on. You know, we tried to follow the logic of, we wanted the cars to be par parked opposite of the fire hydrants so that if there was an emergency incident that the fire trucks could pull right up and connect to the hydrant. The cars are parked on the other side. So we're, we're trying to kind of strain some of this stuff out, recognizing that there might be stuff that you don't want strained. So that's kind of why we're coming back before we go out to the public. If you want more uh, pieces on sidewalk discussed, then tell us and we'll put those in or on street widths. Um, but ultimately, we're going to communicate this the way that you want to, recognizing this is 
a significant project with significant dollars being expended. So. When we had our last public meeting, 98% of the comments were about sidewalks. It wasn't about sewer and water, wasn't about the, word, um, the road, wasn't about curb and gutter, it was about sidewalks. That's semantics. Reality of the matter is, is sewer and water, road, curb and gutter is critical. It's all going in. It's natural to put a sidewalk in. Where it goes, that's semantics. That could be a job site decision for that, for that matter. But I believe in moving forward um, with the sidewalk as it's presented and we can discuss options later but in order to get plans and specs moving forward, um, I believe that that would be the way to roll. So. Okay, well, I will um, concede then because it looks like the other four members of the council um, would like this section to go forward. So at that point, that would be a majority recommendation. Are you clear? Do you have enough direction from us? Mm -hmm. Okay. Did I interrupt you? No. Okay, then we'll move on. We'll send a draft out before we mail it. <laughs> I guess, I guess my, my quick question was, who attends this open house? It'll be Dan and other members of Bolton and Mink. Okay. Um, myself, and Brian. Okay. Um, Council members and Dan. Okay. <laughs> the, ultimately, it's the council's choice if you choose sure. to attend. I, I'd be of the position, I think it's, be better if the staff could just report back to you what the feedback was because yeah. um, it it could we could set up situations where you're, you know you're getting different bits of information than mm -hmm. other council members depending upon availability but ultimately that's your choice it's not sure. for me to say whether you should go or not we're going to take really good notes or try to and then summarize and then invite everyone who has additional comments and questions and wants to participate mm -hmm. to come to the meeting on the 4th. We're gonna be really clear on that is that the, the reason for the open house is frankly to get folks, you know, one, to answer their questions, mm -hmm. but two, if they wanna uh, present to the council on the 4th, that they have all the information that they need to mm -hmm. give you their best argument for or against whatever right. uh, com uh, components of the project, whether that's sidewalk, street widths, or just the project in general. Mm -hmm. um, that makes sense. I mean, I just, I feel comfortable that we have the right people there to answer all of those detailed questions and provide all that information to the residents. So, okay, good. Let's move on. All right, um, moving on to item number eight, unfinished business, the organization resolution to amend 101-19. Mr. Merrick. So the City Council approved the organization resolution at your January 2nd meeting. Uh, the Council intentionally uh, did not fill the Carver Business Council or what we call the Carver Business Alliance as well as the second position on the Township Fire Board. Uh, now that the full roster of the City Council is in place, uh, we're looking for the City Council to amend uh, that resolution 101-19 uh, to fill these two vacancies. And I think essentially what we're asking is, so are you interested in the Carver no, 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 Business no, 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 no. Council and the Township Fire Board? Um, I, so I'm aware of the Carver Business Council meeting schedule. Can someone fill me in on Township Fire Board? Twice a year. Twice a year. TBD. Oh, twice a year. Okay. Was TBD? June and November last year? Some, or October, something like that. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's right after work. It's after work hours, so it's not a daytime meeting or a morning okay. meeting. And it is. It's literally twice a year. It okay. It could be a 430 meeting, depending on what time. Right. Right. But I mean, it's not like it's yeah. twice a year that's well scheduled in advance. That sounds completely reasonable. I'm comfortable with that. Yes. You can put my name down for both TBDs. You need a motion? Do we need to <coughs> a motion to amend resolution 101 19 with Council Member McKnight on the Township Fire Board and the Carver Business Council? Just to, for clarification, the Carver Business Council isn't twice a Right. That's the third yes. Friday. Okay. Correct. Third Friday at 8 o'clock. I, I was briefed. 
group of people. Yep. <laughs> great group of people. I was briefed, yes. So I'll make a motion to uh, adopt the reorganization resolution uh, or amend the resolution 101-19 and put my name, um, Joy McKnight, under the Township Fire Board and Carver Business Council. We have a motion from Council Member McKnight. I'll second that. And a second from Council Member Henry. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. All right, item Congratulations. eight. Point two, <coughs> the strategic plan update. Mr. Thank, Merrick? Thank you, Mary Council. So um, wanted to go through the strategic plan adopted by the council um, about just, o just over two years ago where, uh, ha where we have scheduled a strategic plan um, kind of goal setting retreat for the council at the end of February. So I wanted to kind of run through uh, what we went through that those two years ago, uh, provide an update uh, hopefully um, providing maybe kind of a spark for discussion for our next session, uh, but also maybe to affirm maybe some pieces uh, that maybe aren't to be complete and get some feedback, early feedback from the council, and maybe items that maybe aren't so much of a, a priority. I know there's one that I'd like to get some feedback from the council on um, as we go forward. So we kind of separated our strategic plan into three main areas. Uh, one, opportunities. Um, and so thinking about Carver, uh, that Carver would have exceptional recreational venues that meet the needs of the community and attract visitors, and also services and infrastructure to meet uh, the current needs and promote future opportunities and investment. And so uh, the big piece, and especially think about two years ago, was uh, Carver City Hall, um, and talking about the task force. And so we have construction completion, summer 2019. Uh, the levy certification process really took a big step this fall with hiring WSB. Uh, they're coming in later this week for hopefully what will be uh, a, a lot of progress on a concept that we can hopefully take to the council at an upcoming work session. So we're really making uh, some headway in, in both of those uh, areas. Uh, the other second bucket was development. Uh, Carver is a community that has a variety of housing choices for all stages of life. And Carver has a diverse, vibrant, uh, has a diverse, vibrant community with a combination of unique shops, established businesses, and industry. Um, so one of the main strategic plan areas is sitting back to my left, Aaron Smith was hired as the city planner. Um, the other piece that I'd like some feedback from the council is we had a, a big plank of reviewing professional services and it was create a and implement a process that will foster continuous growth and development for professional services used by the city. Um, and I, I'd like some permission or some conversation with the council to tweak that in the, I think this represents a somewhat antiquated model for doing kind of what's akin to an annual review. Um, we're really in a position that I think we've developed a culture where, you know, if there's something that we're concerned about, whether it's with the city engineer, the city attorney, the auditor, that we give kind of immediate feedback and discuss those issues. I think this is premised on the model that we wait till December and then we give the city attorneys the feedback that we wanted to give them in March. And, <laughs> and so rather this than, its impact. so then rather than create a, this formal kind of rigid structure where we're gonna have this, you know, five page performance evaluation, uh, we just, I like the idea of just ongoing discussions, you know, uh, you know, I meet with Dan once a month. I've met with Craig Schmidt on different issues. Uh, I check in with our, you know, kind of uh, on-site department head team and we talk about, you know, how are our consultants doing. I think that creates a more organic and impactful process than, you know, circling a number on a sheet of paper that says you get a four for this year because of thus and so. Um, but understanding that this was part of the piece, I, we haven't done anything with it. I took a few shots of it. I have some stuff prepared. It just, it didn't seem natural. It kind of felt conjured and so I didn't move forward with it, but I wanted to get some feedback from the council. We can still pursue it, but I, I wanted to share that feedback. If you think that's the model that works better, then I would say you're right on track, go for it. Yeah, I agree. If I remember, it was you kind of driving this items, and it's certainly you has to implement it. If that's what you're feeling and what works best, 
Let's not fix what's broken, not broken. Yeah, I would just like to know if there's ways we can support it or being new to the council too, what ways we can help impact it in a positive way. Yeah, I think that'd be, I mean, I think that's, that's a great comment because that's one of the things that it's not just a staff perspective. I mean, it's enlightening that we can reach out to the council and say like, you know, how's Dan doing? How's Larry doing? You know, <laughs> how is Abdo doing? Maybe wait till after this 2019 you project. You forgot Carl Sanderson. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> can we get one for Brian Skok? <laughs> <laughs> There's so many jokes there. I'm just <laughs> So uh, the other two buckets with development is develop a set of goals within the comprehensive plan that can be implemented and measured. And so that's promoting that life cycle housing. And so that's included in our draft 2040 plan. Um, the second area we've kind of dipped our toe in the water as it relates to developing a marketing plan and economic development strategy. So we did that community communications and marketing audit with WSB. I think it was it was relevant, it was affordable, but it, I don't know if it necessarily got to the heart of what the council was discussing a couple of years ago. Um, so we spent 2000 of that $10,000. Um, so I think there's an opportunity for the council to talk about that when you get into your goal session or goal setting session again, and maybe drill down a little bit more on what this means and what are maybe some better action items. I mean, I think we, set aside some money with the idea of like, okay, we should do something, but we really didn't hammer down on like what that should be and what yeah. would be a good use of those funds. Cause you know, there's a million people, you know, locally or on the web that will happily take your money to like, <laughs> you know, create a Facebook page for you, do some type of branding or make you a coffee mug. So I, I think we're, we wanna be a little bit more surgical with this. Mm -hmm. But I'm not exactly sure what that means or or what to do with that. Um, I think we got some good nuggets from that marketing audit, like thinking about us ourselves as the city of Carver. I, I've really been trying, and I know the staff has been as well, like saying city of Carver and Carver County. Like I even just look at our like Carver Historic District signs on 212 and think, you know, we could probably easily add city of Carver Historic District. Um, because my parents still get confused whether or not I work for Carver County oh, in the city yeah. of no. Carver. So. Oh my, can they yeah. make After it to the February 4th meeting and we can? <laughs> you don't want, trust me, you don't want them here. <laughs> no, I think we do, it might be fun. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want them here. Um, uh, I think a really uh, big success from our strategic plan, it was a small piece, but I think it, it really made a difference was the um, formalizing the business group or the business alliance. Uh, that group has met in different forms for my entire time here and prior to me being here. You know, they'd meet for three or four months, then it'd go away, then an issue would pop up, then they'd meet <laughs> again for a year and it'd go away. And now I think we've really developed a culture that people are coming in new, business are, are being replaced, and it doesn't necessarily need to be someone's fault when someone closes. Sometimes that's just the natural course of things, but there's a really nice dialogue and relationship with mm -hmm. our business community. And I think as we grow that business community, there's gonna be more opportunities for partnerships and leveraging of resources. So I'm really excited to see um, where this ends up in the next few years. And if I can add to that, Brent, with the same feedback that I shared with you privately today. So this was, this was all Brent and the conversations that have taken place around that table are so valuable and the network and the community that we've built among those business owners, the information that we're learning, it's breaking down the wall between mm -hmm. the city right. and the business community. It's fostering communication, it's fostering goodwill. Um, it's going strong because after meeting for a few months and somebody suggested we take the summer off, Brent was like, no, no, no. <laughs> That's where meetings go to die. We are gonna be meeting. <laughs> so, that's, that's all life. Brent, and he's done a really good job with that group, yeah. so Keep it going. kudos. Thank you. Uh, then the final area is identity, uh, embracing a unique history and our natural heritage, and then a community built on trust with value through partnerships and civic engagement. Um, this is a, an item that you know, I wanna bring back in a work session. So we've talked about conducting a professional resident survey. There are, are several cities in the area that do that. I, I'd like to bring in somebody that does that work, give you an overview 
of their process, their methodology, um, and you know it can be a significant cost. I know there's cities that try to do that informally, um, but it really puts you know the data um, in question. And so I think there's some really good questions that we could ask related to you know transit service, related to recreation, related to how we're doing on communication that uh, could be asked. So I'm looking forward to having that conversation with the council um, and a survey professional. And if we decide not to move forward, at least we have some information. Um, complete the parks uh, master plan. So uh, tailor the parks master plan to emphasize the city's parks and open space amenities. Uh, we're working our way through that. Uh, part of the thing that kind of extended that is we really wanted to get into our, our park dedication plan and what we're charging for fees, and so Brian has really been doing a good job with that. Um, it it kind of lends itself into an area that I'll be giving an update on li later in the meeting. I'll give you a, a preview now that one of the th things that we're changing internally is Aaron's going to be taking over the administration of the Parks Commission, really trying to focus the Parks Commission on, on planning. Um, there'll be a maintenance perspective to that, that public services will continue, but as far as setting the agenda and the corresponding relationships with the Parks Commission, Aaron's going to be running that from a planning perspective, really hoping to kind of drive home the planning part, giving public services the maintenance piece. But frankly, one of the big pieces is there's so much stuff going on in public services with water, storm sewer, streets, parks, et cetera, just from a day to day. Um, we're really trying to kind of shrink Brian's plate so he doesn't have to have his arms all over everything to manage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, I have a question then. So Erin will be taking over the Parks Master Plan part with the Parks Commission. Will she be now be the staff liaison completely to the Parks Commission? Correct. All right, I just want to make sure I hear the, or heard that correctly. <clears throat> and then how about for the HPC? Because Erin, will you also be the staff liaison for the so HPC or is that Mark and she'll manage that from kind of a big picture perspective but mark is gonna kind of operate hpc from a day to day and be the staff liaison only if there's a significant project where someone wants to do a building tear down then aaron would pro provide support it kind of lends itself into the model that we're going to be pro um, proposing for 2020 where building inspections and planning combine into a community development department okay. so aaron's going to provide kind of the overview support but Mark will be kind of the day-to-day -day and the meeting contact. So Mark will be the one attending the meetings? Or Correct. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, this is another area that involves resources, uh, but we had to develop professional grade trail resources, maps and marketing materials for visitors. Um, we had actually, we had a meeting with the Fish and Wildlife uh, folks today and talked about even just ways that we could do you know additional signage to get people to you know the Rapids Lake Visitor Center and to the uh, Ash Street Trailhead. Uh, we really have some unique natural amenities and so uh, we're looking at uh, developing some resources for, and we'll have that budgeted for our 2020 budget and so we can um, kind of hammer down on some of those specifics about what you want that to look like and maybe amenities that you want to emphasize when we get into those details. And then the big piece, and this is, it's probably good that it's one of the last ones, is we, you know the city spent a considerable amount of time and resources developing a downtown master plan. And so one of the big pieces of that was developing the end of Broadway or the terminus of Broadway. Uh, the city took a major step with the development of Broadway between 4th and 6th and developing a streetscape. We we'll really want to have a conversation with the council of what what that first step looks like with the end of Broadway. If it's a big step, if it's a series of small steps, um, but considering kind of resources and how that area is being used now, there's you know right now we have the construction trailer for City Hall, we have storage for public services, um, and a boat. And a boat. Yep. Got a lot going on. <laughs> and there are there are opportunities, but it. With a, with a new council, with new commissioners, it might be good for us to kind of, you know, bring that back out mm -hmm. and talk about our goals and then say, okay, let's develop some priorities, let's develop a schedule based on resources, let's kind of have that conversation over again. I think that's so awesome. So that might be one of the pieces that we talk about um, in February. So this was a overview meant to kind of, if there is additional discussion or items, you're like, 
you know, this is something I really want to kind of dig into or this is something that I'm going to be interested in uh, for February or if it's just this was a good overview that we can be ready for the end of February, 1st of March for our session. I think it all looks really good. I have a question if we're looking at the end of Broadway here for possible a reconstruction of whatever that might look like. Um, if we are also in the process of looking at the levy and how we might certify that, do we want to wait? Does one need to piggyback on top of the other rather than trying to do those congruently? Correct. Yeah, I think that's a good question. I think that's I think that's the goal is try to get that concept and see how they fit together and make sure that we don't do anything that's incompatible with something that will have to happen with the levy. Right, and I'm just thinking, because it is our CBD area, um, that if we did rectify the levy issue, that possibly then we could look at having a, someone would build and possibly another business down oh. where like the PU building is now. Right. Um, and then that could be something we could we could actually extend our business district. So that's why I'm saying if we gotcha. if we look at it, maybe the, how the levy turns out first and what we can get with that, that might open up even more opportunities for that end of the road. Yep. Thank you. It sounds like a good agenda. I don't have anything else to add at this point in time, but I'm going to ruminate on it. And if I come up with so many brilliant ideas, I'll shoot you a note. But it's good stuff. I'm excited. Yeah. I think it looks good. All right. On to communications. So, ladies, this is where we generally just kind of go around the room. If you have I any have updates. no updates. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Council Member Sayre. <laughs> My first park and rec meeting, and I've got to learn how to say the, the correct way formally park and rec park board. Board. Parks Commission. Yeah. Yeah. Parks Commission. The, my first Parks <laughs> Commission meeting has been postponed. The January one got scheduled, so looking forward to attending that in February. Member Mock? Sure. Um, we had a 212 Transportation Alliance meeting, and it looks like Carver County, I'm just reading from my notes here, um, and partially with Brent's um, overview. Thank you for looking at my notes. So Carver County is working toward finding additional resources to close the funding gap. Um, the four-lane expansion project from Carver to Cologne could happen as early as 2022. Mm, okay. <laughs> Three years. Five years. Seems very early for a big project like yes. that. Um, Carver County and MnDOT are working on an agreement to secure right-of-way along the corridor. So they do have to um, acquire quite a bit of right-of-way, and mm -hmm. um, they know that, that some will be easy and some is not going to be. Of so, course. Yeah, so they are, they are going to have to work through that. And then... Uh, they're looking for, so that if you go up to Cologne, that kind of, the R cut, I guess the R turn, but where you kind of, you cross yeah. and you turn back, um, is what they're proposing for 43 and, or excuse me, and 212. 43 is the one that goes to like Dahlgren Golf Course, and there's a church yep. right there on that corner too. So. Um, we did also have discussions in the past about having an overpass. Um, mm -hmm. On 212, and I'm, you'll have to help me with this one, Brent. It's the north-south, and it will go over, um, but it's not. It's There's not a that. street there now, but right. it's halfway between uh, 11 and 43. Yes, yes, thank you. So that is, we did hear mention of that. We did bring that up so mm -hmm. that we are trying to keep that on their radar. That's yes. That's something we want. <laughs> Good. Okay. Um, and then this Saturday is the Soggy Bottom Golf Tournament. It is supposed to be very cold. Please come down to Riverside Park from 11 to 2. We have a heated tent. We have beverages to keep you warm. Um, and it's a good, a good time. Good fire. And a big fire. So we'll be And set. you don't need tickets. You can just come down to have yep. lunch. And you can absolutely we serve food also. So you can come down and eat if you'd like. Um, and, yeah, you don't have to go online ahead of time. You can certainly come down and, and register slash donate that day. Council Member Henry? <laughs> Um, I'd like to welcome Joy to the council. Thank you. Congratulations on Thank your first you. meeting. Uh, second meeting. <laughs> um, the planning commission meeting for this month is canceled. So other than that, I would she like to. She never cancels meetings. The, Janu the January meeting that was supposed to be last week was canceled. Mostly just giving you a hard time. They heard I was. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Brent, I briefly mentioned it to you today, but I would like to see if we could get bi-weekly or council updates from Krauss Anderson 
as to um, the progress and kind of a schedule because I'm hearing about it. For City Hall? Yeah. For, for City Hall. Hall. Okay. Sure. Um, we do get asked quite frequently. <laughs> That'd be good. Just like we've had, you know, for any of the street improvement projects, we have, we've gotten really nice yeah, updates from the city. Yeah, we get them all summer, kind every of all week. Of that format would be great. So, other than that, um, got nothing. Question about, um, I know we have to, a lot of slots to fill on planning commission and probably some of the other commissions. What's the timeline for that? Do I get a oh, okay. list of updates <laughs> here for you? So, we have... 13 applicants for our commissions that we're yes. going to try to schedule for your February 4th work session. Okay. Um, we have 12 applicants for the uh, building inspector job that we um, were seeking applications for that uh, Mark and Aaron are reviewing. When does that close? Or I mean, sorry, it close. When do, are you expecting to hire? Awesome. Um, I don't know. Aaron, can you speak to the hiring schedule? Sure. So Mark and I reviewed applications today. We're anticipating first round of interviews Friday and Monday of this coming week. The position is anticipated to start March 1st. Okay, thank you. Great. A uh, couple other things. Speaking of City Hall, so I've invited Carl Sanderson and Wold to present at your regular meeting on February 4th. So they'll be doing a slide presentation um, and be able to answer questions, introduce themselves to the council again. Um, what I can do is I get a, we have a weekly construction meeting on, on Thursday mornings on the project and they provide a look ahead. So mm. it's basically a schedule, so I'll just forward that onto the, that the council. Would probably that'd, be be awesome. that'd probably meet our request. And it breaks it down by task, you know. Oh, cool. So. Uh, on the February 4th meeting, also be bringing a draft set of legislative priorities. Uh, the council has regularly, or at least for the past probably three or four years, adopted legislative priorities. Um, some of them are related to, you know, funding for the certified levy, um, promoting uh, our local representatives' support of or opposing bills that preempt city council authority. So if they want reverse referendums on certain items, et cetera. Um, I alluded to an issue earlier, the, the, um, we met with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife today. Uh, there, there's part of their, the Ash Street Bridge, you know, that bridge as you enter into the Fish and Wildlife area, part of that bridge is on city property and they'd like that to be all on Fish and Wildlife property. So we were discussing with them, because there's a, I know it's about a, maybe a four acre um, parcel that we own and we're contemplating, we're discussing trading them that parcel for a easement that would allow along the length of our levy system along property that they own so that we can maintain and construct improvements along our levy. We're, the goal is frankly to get that so that if we are in a position to certify it, we don't have to go to them and ask them to provide us an easement because we'll have to have documented uh, land authority to do improvements on that levy system. We can do it right now through prescriptive rights, but if we're going to actually do a construction project, we'll need some type of documentation um, allowing us access and the ability to perform those improvements on their property. So we're, we're still figuring out the details. They want us to provide some additional information, but that's what we're attempting to do. Is there a reason for acquiring that property to do improvements upon it? Well, if we do a certified levy or do... No, 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 not our piece. Why the U.S. Fish and Wildlife wants that city-owned piece with the bridge? They, so that's behind what I'd say on the river side of the yeah, levy? Yeah, I understand. So they, are they acquiring it because they want to do improvements upon it? No, so the bridge was done, I'm not sure what year, but it's a fairly new bridge. Mm -hmm. They don't want a... A federally owned bridge that's not they don't want to own the bridge on property they don't own oh because they own the bridge yeah. correct oh okay got it I didn't yep. know that okay thank you uh, one of the things we're also trying to, to coordinate um, and thanks to, to Brian he's and Mark they've done a lot of work with this is the the cover black Sox were awarded their is it the regional 
the regional baseball tournament, which is scheduled for the first weekend in August. Mm -hmm. So there's quite a bit of coordination, and so this might eventually come back to you. The, the one thing that's going to be a little bit of a challenge is there are some requirements that the Black Sox need to fulfill for whatever the baseball association is that awarded them that may or may not require structures in the in community parks, so extension of um, uh, bleachers or you know media areas. And the, the, the problem with that is, as some of you know, there's a big Excel Energy easement through there. And at one point, I don't know, five or six years ago, Excel Energy actually was telling us that we needed to take that backstop down. So we had to threaten, like, you really want us to tell the local town ball team to take their backstop down? That's not going to happen. But I, it's one thing to argue to keep infrastructure in place. It's another thing to, like, construct, you know, things that are going to be infringing on that. So we need to come up with a plan, understand what the Black Sox need. Um, can it be temporary? Pardon? I don't know the scope of what they need, but is it things that they can we can have temporarily that they could rent and bring in maybe, and it doesn't have to be. I I, I don't know what the scope is, so we're gonna <laughs> find out what that scope is um, and what the standards are. Um, we're we're really gonna try to support them, understanding the kind of the nature of their organization, and for selfish purposes, not wanting to be you know, here on July 15th, trying to figure out how we're going to make this all work. Because there's, sure. you know, if they're with the amount of people that they have, how we're going to navigate parking, um, different licenses they may need, the construction pieces. I mean, they're, they're talking about some, I've heard kind of superficially, some wanting to add some, you know, bullpen facilities. And so what, you know, who's paying for what? And so we really want to draw up a work plan, who's going to do what, what the, obstacles are, how, what the resources are that we can provide. And so once we can gather that, and if we run into roadblocks, we might come back to you and say, how would you like us to, to deal with this? Uh, understanding this is a significant um, piece for Carver um, and a, a significant opportunity for the Black Sox as an organization to flourish, so. Brent, I'd like to add a comment. Since we're planning so far ahead, um, my comment is, I think this would be a good time to open a discussion on burying some of those cables or the the power lines. Oh, those power lines? Mm -hmm. and those maybe I'm way off, but. We, I know that we have talked about it in the past, so this is. So for future conversations, yeah. I just, since we're already planning this far ahead, great time to have that discussion, if it's even a possibility. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. I'm sure it is. I just don't know. Very expensive. The last time we looked into it, very. But go ahead and look at it. Yep, we'll do it. <laughs> and uh, that's all I have. All right. I would. I did just want to say one thing about the Black Sox. Um, they are coming to the Lions meeting tomorrow night because I know they are working on their volunteer and staffing plan right now. So they are ac actively. Um, soliciting people who to help out at that so because they want to be mm. really well staffed and well I guess volunteer staffed so I I know that they are putting a lot of thought into it ahead of time also so that's that's good, good. if they're volunteer opportunities it'd be good like the city wants to yeah it would be great to promote that sure I'll let, that. I'll let them know I'll let them know just have one other item since yeah. our work session got cut short if there is any city council requests we usually handle that in the work session mm. but open that up at the regular meeting if there's items that you want staff to look into or items brought back to a future agenda etc um, please let us know I have nothing at this point anybody all right um, Aaron any updates Brian Dan Vicki my only updates um, last week the Southwest Transit Board Regional Council of Mayors Board, and then I alluded to the business council meeting. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt you. <laughs> You're fine. <laughs> um, learning a lot, especially with Southwest Transit, um, and it's all good. So, with that. Oh, do you have the the letter? Oh yes, thank you. Sorry. Um, oh, the other thing that I nearly forgot um, to mention is that this week we got. Um, a letter from the Minnesota Employment and Economic Development um, Commission letting us know that we um, 
have received the Innovative Business Development Public Infrastructure Program Grant for Lakeview Industries. So nice. it's official. So what, what does that mean? I'm sorry, I need background. Um, that is for the road work on what will be the water tower. opportunity. Commerce. Commerce Oh, Drive. the one that goes north-south. Yes. To the east of the Lakeview property. Yes. So okay. It's because that wasn't part of Lake. Lakeview wasn't going to be building that. Correct. That so the, the city Commerce Drive it. is going to be funded through tax increment financing okay. from Lakeview, and then fifty percent from the grant, which the is. Grant. Nine hundred and ninety-seven thousand. Oh wow! Awesome. Yeah, it's almost a million okay. dollars. Okay. So. Cool. So, and uh, kudos to Aaron Smith who wrote the grant for that yes. project. Thank you. So she paid her way this year. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait for next year. <laughs> All right. With that, I would like to make a motion to adjourn. All right. Second. Motion by Councilmember Mock, seconded by Councilmember Henry. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you all.